Politicians didn't eliminate it. So if there was a, if there was a, a handshake or it was a, that they were both going to do it, how did the United States end up not, you know, they, they followed what they said they were going to do. They were going to dismantle and the nukes. And, why did they allow Russia so to So in continue? the early 90s. So how did that happen? So in the early 90s, one of the things that happened is I think the Russians just didn't have the money to dismantle the tactical nukes. And we made sure that they had the money to dismantle the strategic nukes. So that's the first thing. The second thing is the tactical nukes that the Russians had might not necessarily have the same security that required codes mm -hmm. to be able to use. So our bigger concern right away with the tactical nukes is unlike the strategic nukes, if Iranians or Iraqis or Arab terrorists or North Koreans got a hold of them, they could use them. And it could be a suitcase. So a terrorist could take a former Soviet tactical nuke in a suitcase, God forbid, to New York okay. City. When you're, and it would just when you're describing tactical nukes for our viewers, what is a tactical nuke? Well, they're on short range delivery systems, you know, usually missiles of a few hundred miles. They might be torpedoes to hit a ship, an anti ship missile. They're also on anti aircraft missiles, and they have certain advantages if you're trying to intercept nuclear ICBMs. But they're now, this is the United States, we have tactical nukes as well, don't well, we? Well, we have only one design left. The Obama administration is working on an updated version of that. We only have one type of design, and right now in its current form, it has to be dropped from an F-16 or F-15, which the Russians can easily shoot down. Our F-22... So are you saying that their tactical nukes are more sophisticated than ours? Oh, absolutely. The Russians heavily train and heavily equip themselves to fight a, a so-called limited nuclear war. Um, and like I said, initially, you know, there was a little bit of an uh, innocent thing to it. They just didn't have the money to get to the tactical nukes. By the end of the 90s, they were like, aha, we have a lot more tactical nukes. Now, are they the only country that is, it has the sophistication of the tactical nukes? Well, you know, what actually, about, by the way, I think it's an interesting what about topic. Is, what about Israel? Well, I was just going to say, just as an interesting topic, I find this very interesting. There are very credible reports that Israel has tactical nukes. They're very sophisticated. Maybe they were able to get American designs. And the reason it's significant, and it, it's very interesting to people, is people never understand how t uh, nukes could actually help Israel. Unfortunately, it's less of a, a threat right now if they were overwhelmed by Syrian tanks in the Golan or Egyptian tanks in the Sinai or even Iraqi tanks and Saudi tanks by Jordan or the West Bank. And the reason is they do probably have tactical nukes which have um, very low um, levels of long-lasting fallout. So would minimally threaten Israeli civilian centers even if it's nearby and would have special features for armored conflict like, for example, localized EMPs that would fry the electronics of the enemy vehicles. In fact, let me tell you an interesting anecdote that illustrates tactical nukes. And I cannot prove it absolutely, but apparently the vast majority of physicists who study nuclear weapons say this had to be an Israeli nuclear test. During the Carter administration, a U.S. spy satellite, which was supposed to be retired, and I guess people didn't realize it was still operating, detected a very distinctive double flash off the coast of West Africa in the ocean, in the Indian Ocean. I think it's the Indian Ocean, mm -hmm. but off the coast. And it was a double flash that looked exactly like a nuclear test. And about halfway around the world, specialized sensors detected the equivalent blast of something half as powerful as Hiroshima. Now, the U.S. automatically sent military planes into that area to try to pick, uh, pick up fallout. Mm -hmm. And this is where it gets interesting. It didn't detect any fallout. So that the blast was so clean. And who did this again? It had to be the Israelis. Because it was very sophisticated. You know, first generation you know nuclear weapons yeah. put out are very dirty, put out a lot of fallout. Now there was a cover up. But the only physicist who ever said it could be anything but a nuclear blast were hired by the Carter administration in a White House like mm -hmm. investigation or commission, yeah, because we don't but they didn't want to deal with it. So the Carter administration, yeah. if they acknowledged that Israel, possibly with the cooperation of another then U.S. ally, South Africa, they had all kinds of issues. See, it's interesting because we know what Russia has, and in our next program we're going to talk about the different um, bombs and different, uh, uh, you know, the submarines and everything that uh, Russia has, but we don't know what Israel has. And that's now, Renew, by the way, an Israeli spy took pictures of how nuclear we weapons. How come we don't know well, what well, they well, have? So, well, first of all, the United States doesn't officially want to acknowledge it because there would be legal issues. Israel is not covered by the, 
Israel under the MPT is not allowed to have any nuclear weapons. MPT is? Non-proliferation treaty. Okay. So there was an Israeli spy who ended up in Israeli prison who took pictures of nuclear weapons that were either thermal nuclear or boosted. So that the experts said they looked a lot like nuclear bombs with about a yield of 200 kilotons mm -hmm. when Hiroshima was 17 kilotons, which is why Israel also was a very powerful strategic deterrent. Ten years ago, it was estimated, God forbid, Iran fired nuclear weapons at Israel, they would lose, the Iranians would lose 20 million Iranians. Now, the point of this deterrent is not that Israel wants to kill a million or even a single Iranian, but Iran would be wiped off the face of the earth if they were able to and were stupid It's enough. interesting, in Iran, it always says they want to wipe, wipe Israel off the map. You know, Israel, like many societies, say the guy who always talks about how many girls he gets, gets nothing. So the <laughs> Israelis funny. don't really talk about wiping. But Shimon Perez, who is, you know, many people think, well, he wasn't really in the military, and he's always trying to make peace. But he was also the father of Israel's nuclear weapons project. He's believed to have been basically in charge of it decades ago. He's now like 80. I forget how old. He's really old. But I mean, thank God, I think he's still, but he had a stroke or something. But anyway, he said just a few years ago, Iran can be destroyed too. But the truth of the matter is, Israel has far more capabilities to destroy Iran than reverse. Interesting. So, but, but but go, but, back, so go back Russia. to Putin. Yeah, go back to There's Mr. only Putin. two nuclear superpowers, though. This is what everyone forgets. Russia and the United States have 90% of the world's nuclear weapons. Yeah, and everybody, and everybody talks about Iran, and everybody's so afraid of Iran when Russia has is one of the biggest superpowers. Yeah, so and even has, that we'll do in our next show, even more sophisticated equipment. And why... Well, there's no comparison. Then why... It seems like, Michael, you seem to be the, I, I, one, of the, one of the few people that know all this. But our why generals, are, our but, generals say yeah, that Russia why is the are, only existential but why are, threat to Why are people talking because about people it? Because people are ignorant, they're poorly informed, and they're not thinking. You know, uh, you know, people don't even really remember or know of tactical nukes because on television they always like to flash the sensational images of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, horrific strategic bombing, and yes, the Russian strategic bombs get hundreds of times more powerful. But I'm talking but about now. Nukes are, but I'm but talking no, no, about but tactical now. nukes are for the battlefield. So if you imagine that Russian nuclear strikes have to be against cities, you, you think that in itself is so horrifying that they probably wouldn't do it. But the reality is Russian nuclear strikes can be smaller, can be cleaner, can be targeted at our aircraft carriers, at entire naval fleets, at Turkish tanks. So if the Russians get into major clashes with the Turks, which is actually what I believe Putin might want, they have to use tactical nukes because the Turks have thousands of tanks. And the Russians, unlike the old Soviet Union, don't have the ability to deploy you know, millions of so, troops and so, tens of thousands of tanks. So what does Putin want? Does he want to get back and, and let Latvia and Lithuania and all the Baltics? Does he want them under his control again? Well, no, he can't really occupy a lot of territory. Or the, what we worried about in the early 80s is the Warsaw Pact would launch an invasion of even like 2 million troops, tens of thousands of tanks. Although that would be crazy because the U.S. in desperation might fire 100 or 200 mm -hmm. tactical nukes to stop it. And the odds of such a massive conflagration that involves hundreds of tactical nukes going completely out of control into full-scale strategic nuclear war were pretty high. And yeah, so what? Putin wants to control the escalation, first of all. That's one of the reasons why he doesn't want total war. He wants skirmishes, like clashes they can control. But it can involve tactical nukes. And, and, and when and the, world's lar the country with the world's largest nuclear arsenal uses tactical nukes, it will scare the crap out of everyone. So what does he want? <laughs> I didn't use, uh, you know, that that saying, that yeah. But, but, you know, one of the things that he wants is he's invested hundreds of billions of dollars modernizing his nuclear arsenal. And he does it because he believes it's valuable. He does it, It's not a symbolic thing for him, but in order to leverage it, he has to demonstrate to the world that nukes matter. And the only way I believe he will really be able to convince the world that his nukes matter is by actually using them. Yeah, but right now, um, I saw in the paper, which I have right over here, Latvia seeks NATO help against new Russian aggression. There's a new Russian aggression. So what and is the Baltics so what, is, very about what is that? Maybe you can talk to the viewers about what is Russian adventure, you know, uh, uh, aggression and 
the, seems like the other the countries are getting worried about it. Well, absolutely, they are. I mean, there was just a study beginning of this year by the Rand Corporation that if the Russians invade Estonia, we couldn't stop them. And when we tried to go in, we wouldn't even have adequate forces. And in Desert Storm in 1989, 1990, why would we be able to stop? Because them? we don't have the hardware, the tanks and APCs, uh, armored personnel carriers. Though we're sending them, we even just sent recently in the last six Will months. Will the United States step in well, if they we, go into but, Latvia? But, but, but it takes they too go long. into Lithuania. It takes too long. When so, they went into. Um, what was the other country they just went into? Ukraine. The Ukraine, excuse me. The Ukraine, We they thought that the United States would go in and help, and NATO would go in no, and no, help. No, but, but, and no, but, 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 but they still were because requesting. Because we're very close. They were, even though they weren't a NATO member, they still wanted NATO to give them well, a hand. Well, it's interesting. We had They want to belong. No, In fact, but, Ukraine yeah. will try to get into NATO. Well, no, we, so we actually have an agreement from 1994 called the Budapest Memorandum, which is not binding with the Ukrainians, which called them protecting their sovereignty and their territorial integrity. Russia signed it. And in exchange, the Ukrainians gave up their nuclear arsenal to the Russians. Now, the strategic nukes, the Soviet strategic nukes, the, Ru the Ukrainians couldn't use because there were codes to protect them. However, there were articles saying that before the Ukrainians gave up those nukes, they had tried to hire the Israelis to break the codes so they could take over the strategic nukes. But by the way, the, the Soviet tactical nukes in Ukraine... Maybe they should have gotten Snowden. Maybe he would have cracked the code. No, no, Snowden's an idiot. <laughs> Um, Snowden was an idiot who just stole our secrets. He's yeah. a traitor and spy. I know, but, but I was just I was just making a joke. No, I know, but so the the tactical nukes, the the, the, the Soviet tactical nukes, had the Ukrainians kept them, mm -hmm. they could have probably used against the Russians, and then the Russians wouldn't have been able to invade. Um, so we had this agreement, but it was non-binding. It wasn't a treaty that was ratified by the U.S. Senate, um, and we were afraid because Russia is a nuclear superpower. Um, in terms of if they storm into Estonia, we lack the hardware right now to to even take it back. It would be very bloody. We could lose hundreds of thousands, or sorry, tens of thousands of American troops even before the Russians resorted to tactical nukes. Um, and with Desert Storm, by the way, when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, it took us months to get that hardware, but he couldn't and wouldn't do anything major to stop us. Putin would not sit around watching us send tanks during hostilities. He would use his very, very formidable anti-aircraft and anti-ship missiles to foil us. And in the Baltic Sea, with the highly militarized Russian territory of Kaliningrad, they ha they can really, really threaten our ships in the Baltic Sea. Well, Michael, we're going to be, uh, I see my credits are going down, but we're going to be doing a program, our second program, which is going to be involving what happened in Syria, the pullout of Moscow, and what, what they what their intentions were and what their intentions were to avoid a quagmire in Syria. We're also going to be talking about hybrid warfare, which is a very interesting topic. So I want our viewers to stay tuned for the next, when we, when we put on our next show, which is going to be on the brink of World War II number, <laughs> World War III, not, we, not World War I or II, but now World War III. Hopefully it will never come to World War III, but I think it will be an interesting uh, to, you know, to be I, mean, I, I think we're likely to see clashes with the Russians. I mean, what we saw in Turkey, for example, where the Russians were able to bait the Turks into shooting down that Russian plane, that's, that's, there's going to be more of that. They were heavily baited right. and provoked. Well, Michael, I'm so glad that you came in from Florida to talk about Russia, and I'm glad that you're going to be staying for another show. And we really want to thank our sponsors, our our our. Our, all our people that work here, and uh, our camera people, our producers, our directors, everybody uh, that's, that's here. And we want to make sure that everybody hears what's going to happen next as far as Russia. And it's going to be exciting, It's going to be scary. exciting and very scary, but yes. there's so much happening in the world today. Every time I turn on the TV, something today was what happened in Brussels. And um, By the way, symbolically, it's and, not a good sign of strength right. to see chaos yes, in so we, Brussels, where yeah, the headquarters so, of NATO. Yeah, we're, we're going to be talking more about that and all these other things that are happening into, you know, in, in our country and all the... Our